Welcome everyone. My name is Marlene Linares Gonzalez and I am the Communication and Outreach Coordinator at the Latin American and Iberian Institute at the University of New Mexico. The Latin American and Iberian Institute promotes and supports interdisciplinary teaching, research, and meaningful public engagement to advance the production and dissemination of knowledge about Latin America and Iberia. Latin America is designated as one of seven priority areas of research for UNM, and we proudly contribute to both the university's intellectual community as well as global discourse through our public programming. We'd like to take a moment to recognize traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia on which UNM sits. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo Navajo, and Apache have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the, broad, to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. I am honored and excited today to introduce Dr. Suzanne a. Oakdale, a, a professor in the Department of Anthropology at UNM. She has done ethnographic research in the Brazilian Amazon as well as historical research about the area since 1989. She has written on Kawaite, formerly known as Kayabi, ritual and autobiographical narrative in I Foresee My Life, the ritual performance of autobi autobiography in an Amazonian community, published by 2005 by the University of Nebraska Press. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Oakdia. Hi, I'm going to share my screen. Thanks so much for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that this is, seems somewhat fresh. Um, I'm gonna talk about my new book, um, Amazonian Cosmopolitans, but I of course apologize, apologize to those of you who've heard something similar. Um, let me start here. Amazonia is famous for research showing that the human body is formed through relationships. Parents mold the bodies of newborns with massage, body paint, and jewelry in order to transform them from guests to kin. Uh, similarly, relationships are formed through a bodily idiom. For example, leadership is often established in lowland societies through the nurturing and feeding of others, Brazilian anthropologist Eduardo Viveros de Castro, in his formalization of a general lowland ontology, what he calls perspectivism or multinaturalism, made the insightful observation that different types of bodies are understood to give rise to different perspectives. Those who share a similar type of body through sharing food or treatment to the skin, for example, share similar perspectives. To have the same body means to see each other as fellow persons and part of the same moral community. To have different bodies implies a predatory relationship, such as that between humans and game animals. In my new book, Amazonian Cosmopolitans, I focus on the autobiographical accounts of two lowland Kamuyote leaders that I recorded in the 1990s in central Brazil with an eye to how the narrators describe in a similar bodily idiom, the kinds of relationships they formed with historical figures over the course of the 20th century. I've paired their narratives with archival materials about the places they lived uh, that I found within records kept at what is the Brazilian Bureau of Indigenous Affairs or FUNAI for the Brazilian uh, institution as well as at, I think there are about three different Catholic archives. To my surprise, I found photos of these men and I found accounts in which they're mentioned by name. So um, that was kind of exciting. Uh, taking Viveros de Castro's perspectivism out of the domain of myth and ritual, which is really its usual home, in my book, I apply it to this historical material and in so doing, show how these two men used aspects of perspectivism to live beyond it. The Kawiwete are a Tupi-speaking people who reside in several locations in central Brazil. They used to call themselves Kayabi, and the surname names of many people is still Kayabi, which is why on the cover it says, based on accounts of Prepuri and Savino Kayabi. Um, 
when my narrators, Sabino and Prepuri, were young men, or, or even children, between the 20s and the 60s, 1920s and 1960s, central Brazil was an important focus for the Brazilian state, and in fact, for the world. What struck me most about their stories was how they show that these men who had lived their lives in the seemingly remote Brazilian interior had clearly been cosmopolitans and had been so for a very long time. Cosmopolitanism can be defined in its broadest way as the global extension of moral and political horizons, or simply as implying an attitude of openness. Much like other Amazonians, Kamuyuete value engagement with a wide variety of others, especially for men who are leaders or caretakers of local groups called Wuriat, as well as for those who are shamanic healers. Sabino and Prepuri were both Wuriat, and Prepuri was one of the most renowned Kamuyuete shaman. This engagement encourages a kind of careful watching and learning of others' habits, customs, and sometimes languages. Not all such relations are deemed equally valuable and care is taken to not permanently or uh, completely turn into one of these others. Prepuri and Sabino's accounts are stories about how they navigated a wide range of relationships. And in the case of, the, of Prepuri, who was also a shaman, this included non-human others as well. While they show a kind of self-consciousness about how to engage across boundaries, their stories are not about interior states of mind. Rather, they are stories about how these men's bodies changed as they became part of new social configurations. In keeping with the idea that bodily transformations are a key part of the development of social relations throughout the lowlands. Their stories offer perspectives on how an Amazonian orientation to alterity or the other, noted by so many, especially with respect to myth and ritual again, was lived by particular individuals as they navigated historical moments with other individual people and animals who became friends and allies, not simply instantiations of the enemy. Today, after introducing the kind of large scale projects that took place in 20th century Brazil, I turn to excerpts of these men's accounts that show how both were attentive to the fine grained bodily habits or the habituses of those they encountered as their lives were swept into these projects. I then present a few examples of how their own bodies transformed as they established relations with a range of other people. These, the new perspectives that resulted, however, encouraged them to learn and employ other people's ways of establishing relationships and to become part of new moral communities. Rather than living strictly within bounded villages or a closed group of relatives, which is I think how we often tend to think about Amazonian peoples, they lived oriented to a range of others. Uh, during the 20th century, the Brazilian interior became an increasingly important site for colonization and resource extraction for the Brazilian government as well as others. In the 20s, government pacification teams focused on bringing progress to indigenous Amazonians and on encompassing them and their lands within civilization. The Brazilian government established a characteristic style of contact, contact after 1910 developed by Conte de Rondon, who's in this photo with his back turned to us. Rondon was a man who was in part indigenous himself, his grandparents were Bororo on one side, and he was also a proponent of positivism, he was, which he had learned through his military education. He was actually part of the positivist church in Brazil in early 20th century. Um, this method that he developed was called pacification. And I think that that is probably shared across a variety of, of you know, colonial contexts. But his method focused on offering isolated people gifts of industrially produced objects to lure them into dependence and settle at posts. The, ideally, the desire for goods was to encourage people to learn skills so that they would enter the workforce and buy these goods themselves. Then beginning in 1937, March to the West under President Getulio Vargas was initiated. 
This focused on linking the Western lands and resources to the west of Brazil, to the rest of Brazil, and sent teams out to explore the hinterland. So up to this point, most population was here, you know, on the coasts. They always say that Brazilian population hugged the coasts until the 20th century. This campaign brought increased attention to the Amazon basin and involved intensive prospecting for minerals, road construction, and settlement by colonists on lands that were conceptualized as empty or lacking populate population. Brought scientific expeditions to the interior. Um, it was described as a, a, a merger of the ingenuity of Brazilian backwoods knowledge with the modern. Um, and here's another picture of a bap baptism of a canoe. So this is sort of the uh, what they call the mixed race or caboclo culture of, of Brazil mixed with the high tech science, you know, medical teams and things like that. Kaiwete lands were in the path of this march. During World War II, US um, and Brazilian policymakers also increased rubber production in the Kaiwete forest because it, it was really rich with the very best rubber trees. And thousands of men, about 55,000 in fact, from the coast were transported to trap, tap rubber in the interior. These extractive projects were entwined with ideas about how indigenous people once contacted would join the national society from their so-called primitive state through their labor by becoming national workers. Then after the war, um, state initiatives strove to forge airline routes that crossed Brazil by burning airstrips in the jungle, uh, connecting the interior to the urban south of Brazil and the rest of the world, and making Amazonia a type of corridor for global modern air connection. And Kaibi lands are roughly right around here by the A and the Z in Brazil. And you can see in the 30s, airplanes hugged the coast. They couldn't go across uh, this mass of land because they didn't have a place to, to stop. But by the 70s, you know, here's Pan Am is going right straight over top of Kaibi territory. Um, between the two of them, Sabino and Prepari worked on all of these projects and experienced them from a variety of subaltern positions. Um, okay, and then there's one more. And the next one is it in the 1950s, they both came to live within what's now called the Shingu Indigenous Territory. It was called the Shingu National Park when it first started. Um, this was a new sort of indigenous space set up in central Brazil, dedicated to the protection and the preservation of indigenous cultures in contrast to these previous policies that had promoted assimilation. Prepuri personally encouraged it encouraged many Kaliwete families to move to the Shingu on behalf of the Shingu's directors. He led them by foot, walking for months from the Telus Pires River to the Shingu. Sabino was one of those who relocated at Prepari's urging. And this move encouraged yet another type of expansion of moral horizons. As Prepari and Sabino became part of a new indigenous inter-ethnic community within the reserve. The Shingu was initiated and at first administered by the Villas Boas brothers, men who were leaders of one of the central Brazilian teams in the march to the west. As they told their stories, the Villas Boas brothers that is, they changed their orientations from the goal of the march to realizing the importance of protection for native peoples. This happened after they encountered the Upper Shinguans, a multilingual inter-ethnic society living at the headwaters of the Shingu, not, not one that the Kamiwate had been involved in before this. This society had developed over the course of many centuries as an expanding number of people integrated themselves into this system of shared rituals, values, and trade. Under the direction of the Villas Boas brothers, the new reserve encompassed these upper Shinguan people, as well as others like the Kamiwete, who had relocated to the Shingu in order to avoid, avoid the encroaching frontier. The Shingu was constructed as a utopian space, as the 
inverse image of the progress and development involved in the March to the West. It was set up as a space where all the residents were to pursue a way of life similar to that found before European colonization. In its early years, the Shingu was described as a version of the League of Nations, which has had successfully substituted sport and trade for warfare. As such, it offered hope for humanity's future after World War II. And I think Brazil was often the country, not just in terms of indigenous things, but also um, you know, a, a racial relations that uh, the world looked to after World War II. Um, it was also considered to be a monument of Brazil's pre-colonial past. Both Preparity and Sabino, although they were newcomers, were important facilitators of inter-ethnic relations in the reserve. Fluent in Portuguese, they worked closely with the Villas Boas brothers, especially with the newly relocated groups. Because the Xingu was set up to isolate its residents from the frontier to create a pure indigenous space, it became a place of scientific investigation par excellence, as well as a celebrated locale featured in the media. It was understood you know, as a remnant of Brazil's origins and even all of humanity's origins preserved into present. As a result, it attracted a stream of scientists, journalists, filmmakers, anthropologists, and photographers from all over the world. Preparity and Sabino worked as intermediaries and guides for many of these international visitors. And so paradoxically, in moving to an untouched location on the Xingu River, they also moved into a highly globalized one. And there were so many researchers and, and media journalists and things that, I mean, you could almost consider them as sort of another tribe within the, within the park. So while these two men traveled extensively, they were unlike vernacular, or minority subaltern cosmopolitans in that they didn't move across international lines, crossing the globe as migrants or guest workers have done. Instead, other people and encompassing institutions came to them, intruded into and significantly shaped aspects of their home territories over the course of their lives. I met them both in 1992 when I was doing research project centered on autobiographical narratives. Um, the stories uh, on autobiographical narratives woven into Kawiwate rituals, the stories I focus on in my new book were much less public and formalized than those woven into ritual events. They were part of and took shape within the pre-established roles of researcher and research subject, firmly established within the Shingu. Sabino's son, in fact, requested that I record the story of his father's life and said he had done this for other researchers. Sabino made it slightly different. He told me his story in Camuete, whereas he had previously recorded in, in Portuguese. Preparé's narratives resulted from my asking over the course of several years that he tell me such an account. He told about his life on a series of separate occasions, at times in Portuguese and at times in Camuete. Both men also told versions of these stories to their relatives at other times. Um, one of the most notable aspects of these narratives is the way they describe how these men became acquainted with others that they met as the society of the interior changed through a fine, grain obs fine grained observation of other people's bodily practices. They are examples of what Viveris de Castro calls, using Pierre Bourdieu's term, a habitus, and defines as an assemblage of affects or ways of being, or what Philippe Descola calls an ethnogram, a specialized way of behaving that gives rise to a specific form of physicality. Sabina described the first government teams that came to his family's territory in the 20s, for example, in terms of their handshaking greetings, coffee, excuse me, excuse me, coffee drinking and teeth brushing, many of the newcomers tended to be described through nicknames referring to their physical features. The Italian rubber boss, Spinelli, who ran a large seringal or a rubber camp, was called Big Nose. Claudio Villas Boas, who wore glasses, was stone eyes. 
The upper Shinguans who these men met in the 50s were similarly described in terms of their food, drink, and distinctive ways of moving and speaking. As a whole, their descriptions of their accounts, the descriptions within their accounts feel distinctively prosaic and fine-grained. To give you one example, Prepuri described the angry eating habits of Claudio Villas Boas when he first began to work with him. The Villas Boas brothers, and of course these are three actors portraying the Villas Boas brothers on this movie from uh, 2012. The Villas Boas brothers became well known in Brazil for their adventurous maneuvers with isolated peoples as well as ultimately for fighting for the indigenous cause and establishing the Shingu indigenous territory. Prepuri, who met Claudio as he was fleeing a government post in 1948, was recruited by him to work for his team as they build, built airstrips so as to eventually build Kashimbo military base. This is in the, you know, in the middle of the interior. Prepuri, did the ground truthing, working to assess, oops, okay, working to assess if the areas identified from airplanes above were appropriate for airfields. He also hunted game for the team and fed them. Prepari, who years later considered Claudio to be a great ally, described his distinctive manner in the following story. One night after Claudio arrived late for dinner, Prepari said, Claudio, you're not gonna find any more meat, but go ahead and look. There are eight guans. How could it be there are not any left? It seems they're all eaten. He went looking, 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 what? He stopped. I marked the leg of a guan that was mine. Could it be that people are tricking me? Claudio got up with his plate, his plate full of rice, and he threw it away in anger. He stayed mad at us. Then uh, Claudio killed a guan and he came with a little guan like this one here, which I have up in the corner here, that's a guan. But he pointed to a small bird on his own fire as he was telling me this. I killed seven guans. I cooked the livers inside a banana leaf in the fire, but he didn't want them. You can eat it yourself. Don't call me to eat again. I'm gonna go get honey for myself too. Claudio's anger when he works is really something. Claudio's a little wild, but I got used to him. I got used to the life of whites. Those who don't know the life of whites think he's awful. Oh, Claudio is mad at us. Orlando too, they would say. But not indigenous people are like that. Whites are different than us, I would always say to them. A good leader is one who demonstrates they have this kind of fine grained understanding of others, much as a good hunter has a detailed knowledge of the habits of animals. Because they describe in detail the habits of people they meet, their narratives end up giving an account of massive social ecological projects taking place in the interior of Brazil through the minutiae of small behaviors, toothbrushing, coffee drinking, and rice throwing, as well as the quoted speech inflected with the characteristic style of these others. Sabino's and Prepari's own bodies also became transformed as they opened up the boundaries of their moral community to a range of these others. They describe modifications on their skin or their bodies as having taken place as new relations are formed. At times it's bathed, massaged, pierced, painted, or dressed as these relations take shape. They stress too the action of eating, especially new types of food as the boundaries of sociality are enlarged. Contact in the 20s and incorporation into Brazilian society over the next few de decades is a process that took place according to Sabino as the Kamuete learned to eat more and more white foods, beginning with porridge, progressing through powdered foods, on up to coffee. It also took place as people learned to dress themselves in white clothing, practice that was also valued by the colonizer, Un unlike eating white food, but dressing in, in manufactured clothing was, a, was pretty important. For the Kamuete, this process can, however, be reversed if the body is modified again. And that, of course, is different than ideas about um, becoming civilized for, for Brazilian teams. Um, after being orphaned and spending his childhood at a government post, Sabino was sent to contact 
and pacify, you know, using as a term of the era, some of his more isolated relatives. In 1953, he describes meeting this group while wearing clothing and eyeglasses and being mistaken for white. Once the leader of the isolated group, who looked very much like this man, um, realizes he is coming with Tay, he covers his head and shirt with red Uruku body paint, and Sabino starts to be treated as a relative. Then the chief came and embraced me. He became really happy. He got my clothing all dirty as he was greeting me. He put a lot of red Uruku paint on my head and rubbed it in with his hand. He made my head red, all the while the girls were looking on from above, from the roof of the longhouse. Sabino also described his transition to the Shingu in similar terms. When sent to work in the upper Shingu, he wonders if he will die there, but after routinely eating the upper Shinguan's food, he comes to see these people he once thought of as enemies, as relatives. Kamiuti narratives about shamanic experiences show a very similar pattern. Shamans form alliances with animal spirits once these spirits start to manipulate their bodies. Prepari described his childhood as one in which he was fought over by his human relatives and his spirit, uh, and the spirit beings called the Mait, each side massaging and bathing his body with medicines. Once his human relatives allowed the spirits to continue working on him, then an alliance was formed and they became beings he could call upon to cure. In order to visit different spirits called the masters of game that watch over and control animals, the shaman's body undergoes a transformation. To visit the spirits who watch over water animals, for example, a shaman must cover his body with the down of water birds, such as ducks. When shaman visit their spirit associates, they eat at their homes, foregoing food in the human world. Prepuri often ate in the village of the Capuchin monkey, where he had a girlfriend who he would marry after death. And Prepuri has died, um, and so he is there now. And actually, his son, who is a shaman, has talks to him there. The pattern for relating to historical others seems to be of a piece with these sorts of shamanic practices. One enlarges one's moral community by undergoing bodily changes. Whites like Claudio Villas Boas, however, do not necessarily have the same understanding about the role of the body in establishing a shared perspective and common sociality. Foods, for example, are not necessarily seen to transform relationships. Instead, for the government teams mid-century, it was the acceptance of industrially produced goods and the, and the desire to obtain them that signaled the beginning step of ultimately joining Brazilian society. And Prepuri, because he had worked for so many years on pacification teams, knew this pattern very well. In his story about Claudio, he gives an account of how he tried to influence him through food as they worked to establish Cachimbo base. But how this bodily technique of forging sociable relations was unsuccessful. Claudio would not establish friendly relations with him this way. Instead, his anger stopped only when Prepari gave him an object. As Prepari tells a story, only after manufacturing a diadem and putting it on his plate was Claudio Anger's anger pacified. And he used the same term in Portuguese that was used to describe what these teams are doing with uncontacted people. They're pacifying them. So here's a little segment from that. Um, but Prepari said, so he went for 10 days without eating with me. How could it be? It was my fault. I killed all sorts of birds, even birds' wives. I don't know what else. Here's a really good thing to eat. Do you want it, Claudio? You can come eat. No, I don't want anything. No, please come eat. This is the insolence of a child. It's bad like that, isn't it? Fighting with him, but little by little. Here, you'll like it. He took it, but just looked at it. The guan is on the fire, isn't it? He said, he kept looking at me. The next morning I killed an old maggoty bird by which he meant just the opposite, a really beautiful bird. And I plucked the feathers and I kept them for Claudio. He would not take meat, oh no. I don't know if he was mad at me, but I was not mad at him. It didn't matter to me. People said, let's eat Claudio. 
you can eat. Later, I, I'll eat a little, but without any manioc flour. Then as he took his plate, Prepri gestured that he gave him the feathers woven into a diadem and put it on top of his plate, right where his food would have been placed. Here, you'll like this, Claudio. Wow. He came along slowly. After that, we had a change. He came along. Then we started opening the field for the airplane to land, and then his anger stopped, or he became pacified. In Prepari's story about pacifying Claudio, it's the trade in objects that causes him to make peace. Much as with government pacification teams, it's manufactured objects and the desire for these that transforms people. Though for Claudio in this instance, it's an indigenous artifact rather than an industrially produced Western one. I would interpret this story about a somewhat trivial interpersonal event as a demonstration by Prepari that he really did understand the ways of whites, that the fabrication of bodies through feeding or treatments to the skin did not have the same power for them as did the gift of objects. He learned these new ways of establishing sociability and adapted them. Of course, the exchange of objects is part of sociability for Kalimate as well, but trade does not necessarily change the boundaries of moral communities. Before the bodies of Kamiote became similar to those of whites, these two men recounted how the gift of an ax or a knife could be used easily to kill the, the person who had just given it to them. Prepari's multinaturalist focus on the habitus of others as a means of taking on and establishing a similar perspective led him to an understanding of the different ways others expand their moral community and gave him the ability to call upon these techniques when needed. Having come himself to eat white's food, Prepari's own body was partially white at times. Can we take, think of ethnicity as residing in the flesh of a person's body and eating the foods of others as having the capacity to transform one's flesh over time? Aparecida, another Brazilian anthropologist, has quoted a Wadi man living further to the West in Brazil as explaining that since contact, our bodies are double. Prepuri's habitus is similarly double, part Kamuyote and part white in these accounts. Prepuri describes, much as Sabino does, establishing peaceful relations with other Shinguan peoples by eating their food when he moves there, but he also employed Claudio's artifact collecting, taking on what could almost be called an anthropological manner of sociability. In the 1960s, I found reports that he had a storehouse, perhaps looked something like these, um, full of goods from all over the Shingu, chock full. And it was much like Claudio's own, own storehouse, which he kept at a post. He was um, someone who collected material culture. Brazilian anthropologist Eduardo Galvão reported in 68 that Prepari traded manufactured objects for indigenous artifacts from different people in the Xingu. And he said much in the style of an anthropologist as he traveled with him around the reserve. In the most cited characterizations of perspectivism, the perspectives of human and animals cannot be shared at the same time. The Ferris Jucaster describes um, the shamans taking on of animal bodies through clothing and masks, as well as their perspectives at the same time as they leave the human perspective. He explains the two are like these optical illusions in which when one image is perceived, the other one disappears. When either perceives animals as prey or as fellow persons, persons in which case humans must then be seen as prey. In contrast to this well-cited formalization of perspectivism, there are many examples in ethnographies that show cases of shamans perceiving both animals as humans and persons all at the same time. For Kamiote, like Prepuri and Sabino, multiple perspectives also seem to be operative all at once. They engage in the formation of similar bodies with those they encountered in classically lowland, lowland ways, as well as through the adoption of the habituses of those who were not focused on attaining sociability through the formation of similar bodies. Autobiographical accounts such as these that are included in my book provide one more way of moving beyond thinking about the Amazonian lowlands 
as populated by culturally and linguistically discrete groups, showing it instead as a place that has been marked by wide ranging engagements and involvements. Despite the perennial popularity of the village ethnography, lowland anthropology has in a steady, has a, had a steady and increasing interest um, in approaching Amazonia as a place crisscrossed by networks and inter-ethnic alliances rather than one populated by discrete communities living at great distances from each other due for, due for, um, for example, to impoverished natural resources, linguistic barriers, or closed, closed cultural systems. Some of the earliest were studies of multilingual, multi-ethnic systems, such as, for example, the Upper Shingu, where lives are obviously lived in intimate ways across all sorts of boundaries, linguistic and ethnic, especially where people practice linguistic exogamy or they marry people who don't speak the same language. Um, these works usually tend to see these multi-ethnic systems in, as more or less bounded units though. Structuralist inspired works focused largely on Tupian speakers like Eduardo Viveros de Castro's work and his many students from the Museo Nacional in Rio have also been centered on the outward orientation of lowland people, particularly on symbolic exchanges that cross socio-political, cosmological and ontological boundaries, such as those pertaining to war, cannibalism, hunting and funerary rites. According to Viveros de Castro, drawing attention to these exchanges and what he more abstractly calls the symbolic economy of alterity was explicitly intended to challenge the notion of a village or a society as a self-sufficient unit. There's also been a growing interest in inter-ethnic communication, trade and travel, including, including especially within lowland archeology span of Arawakan speaking populations Work on the performance of indigeneity and interethnic solidarity in political contexts has also been key in highlighting the extent to which indigenous Amazonians are constructing themselves in urban and international contexts, adeptly creating net networks and bringing together the ideals, values, and images of society from ever wider levels of scale. What autobiographical accounts offer is a fine grained focus on how networks and alliances are formed at an interpersonal or individual bodily scale. And with narrators like Sabino and Prapuri, one gets a glimpse for just how long this has been taking place. El Basso, who noted that networks must come down to interpersonal relationships at some point, was one of the first people to draw attention to biographical narrative forms as an important means of describing um, and producing these sorts of relationships in the lowlands. She saw the biographies of past Kalapala warriors as giving accounts of individuals who formulated personal visions of reality different from those around them and redefined the contours of their communities to include enemies and strangers along with themselves as members of a single moral community. And the Kalapalo are one of the groups that lives in the Upper Shingu. And so the Upper Shingu is really famous for um, being a community that kept kind of swallowing up enemies and turning them into allies, friends, part of the same moral community. Um, so in her point was that these stories, these biographies become resources for thinking about future encounters with other sorts of people. Preparee and Sabino's narratives were similar in that they were telling accounts of how they first came to live within new moral communities, whether it be with the Villas Boas brothers, uh, rubber tapping colonists, or the Upper Shinguans. They were both leaders who encouraged others to move to the Shingu to live with new sorts of people. Um, in their narratives, cosmopolitanism becomes both about expanding social networks far and wide, but also about encompassing this expansion at a lower level of scale, bringing it back to bodily ways of being. So um, here, you know, I point out the very bottom of this list here, it was the LAII that financed a lot of the uh, historical research. So very thankful to um, 
to, to the LAII for the fieldwork grants that I received to support this project. Um, I think I'll stop sharing now and um, open it up for questions or discussion or comments or... That felt like a good conclusion when I wrote it, but now that I, now I feel like, God, that wasn't a conclusion, like I just kept going, but uh, it seemed, seemed like a, the appropriate conclusion. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Suzanne. That was an excellent presentation. Um, yeah, so everyone, whoever has any comments or questions, feel free to either um, raise your hand if you want to uh, speak to Suzanne directly, or you can also include your comments and, uh, and or questions in the chat, so. I'm you know, happy to answer questions even about like, I don't know, the methods or something. Um. Um, I have a question. Sorry, here I can turn my video on too. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you so much for. Oh, I'm frozen. I, I, I think oh, I think Jessica may be Jessica's frozen. may be frozen. I yeah, I can't, I'm not hearing anymore. Yeah, it'll reset in a second probably. Jessica, you're frozen. Do you want to maybe put your question in the chat? Or it might help if you turn your camera off too, if you can hear us. I don't know. She might come back. Return. Okay. <laughs> uh, Sarah, go ahead. Thank you. And thank you, Suzanne. I'm going to leave my video off because I'm afraid that's going to happen to me as well. Okay. Um, but I was wondering if you view the book as contributing to um, any sort of decolonization uh, projects, because it sounds to me like uh, sort of shifting the perspective of, you know, who, it, who are the voices you're highlighting? That sounds like a decolonial project to me. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, I guess in the sense that it does shift the focus. Um, I, you know, decolonization, I don't know, I don't master that discourse super well. Um, the Shingu is set up as kind of, a decolonial project, but yet it's a state entity. Uh, it's well within the government's purview. So it's a little hard to argue that it's really decolonized, a decolonized space. Um, I think it is surprising in Brazil how really very few uh, indigenous perspectives on the colonial, um, you know, history one finds. I would say that people tend to, you know, ask indigenous people about hunting, shamanism, and this sort of thing, but they don't maybe ask as much about these colonial processes. And also, you know, it, these men were part of these pacification teams and they're intentionally recruited into them and were over the course of the 20th century. They don't call them pacification anymore. They call them contact. I mean, they still happen, maybe not quite as many, but um, they were very much indigenous workers on all these projects. They had to be because they knew the territory, they knew the languages. So, um, I guess it's a story about colonization in a sense. And is it, de I don't know, Sarah, that's a really good question. You stump me. Is it decolonization? I feel, I mean, I'd like it to be. I, I don't know if it is though. No, thank you. That's a great answer. I'm also, you know, thinking through what that means and not entirely sure what it means. So that was, that was very helpful to think through. So thank you. Thanks. Christina, go ahead. Oh. And then less. Hi there, can you guys hear me? 
Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you so much, Suzanne. That was wonderful. Um, I, as someone who also works um, in the Amazon, I really appreciated your take on perspectivism and the fact that you grounded it um, outside of ritual and myth and, you know, situated it within like historical, specific historical context. I thought it was great. Um, and uh, more than a question, I just would like for you to elaborate a little bit on your methods, if possible, and tell us more about life history as a method, possibly. Well, um, I mean, I do think that my interest when I recorded these things was in rituals and in looking at how, uh, you know, these autobiographical narratives had a social life beyond just being recorded in an interview situation. But because the Shingu was such, um, you know, had decades of researchers, all these people were really understood what anthropologists wanted. So for example, even my first day, the chief said, now you got to do a census. I was like, what do you mean census? I don't do that kind of thing. He's like, no, that's what you do. Come on, let's go. And he had the paperwork already and we're going to do a census. So it's like, they were more interested in these classic, um, maybe, you know, ethnographic methods than I was at first. And I think that these narratives, which I didn't do much with at first, came out of you know, being schooled in ethnography across the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s in this park. It was called a park at first in this reservation. So um, they were things presented to me first. It was Sabino's family who said, you know, Sabino tells his life story. You know, They knew what a life story was. And then I kind of badgered Preparee about it because I wanted, you know, something I wanted from someone else. And he, you could tell he kind of didn't want to do it in the ethnographic way, but he, he humored me and he did it and he recorded it for me. So in many ways, it was like an imported genre, uh, not one that I was even all that interested in looking at at first. And it was also done on the narrator's um, you know, impetus. It was they not so much preppery a little bit, but not so much. It was mostly Sabino. Like I would say maybe Sabino drove this book and his family who had this idea of what a life history was. Um, and, and I would say when I recorded them, I, I kind of did it just to, well, okay, I'm here. You want me to do this? Fine. And then I started to research what they were about later. I didn't know that much about the history of the Amazon because I wasn't trained in it. Um, we tend not to be very historically trained, at least we didn't in you know, my 80s era. I could tell you everything about all the different language groups and I could tell you about cultural patterns, but I couldn't tell you that much about the rubber trade and how the Kamiwate were involved in that, for example. So that uh, meant I had to go back and research these things in archives, and that was actually a lot of fun, and it suited, you know, my life at the time. You could do a month in an archive in a way you can't do a month in the Shingu. I mean, you can, but you don't end up spending much time there by the time you get there, but you could do, you know, a couple of weeks here and there, and um, so then I, I think, and then these guys were already dead by the time I really started looking at some of this stuff, so I couldn't even go back and ask them, like, do you mean this guy when you say this? Is you know, because got all these nicknames, big nose, and and you know, various things. You don't exactly know who they're talking about. Sometimes, you know, some other people helped translate for me. But um my method was not perfect. It's not like, you know, it's kind of like you take what you get and then you roll with it. It was not what I set out in my grant my dissertation research grant proposals to do. It was exactly the kind of research I said I was not doing. And I wasn't gonna do that old stodgy life history, but you know, Sabina wanted to do that. That was his era. Thank you so much. That was, that was really refreshing, you know, to, and then, you know, surprises of the field, doing field work actually. So participating, being there, being present and let it happen and unfold. So that was good. Yeah, and also a field work situation where people have really been schooled in anthropology. I mean, I would say somebody like Prevary, he talked to some of the very best Brazilian anthropologists over the course of the 20th century. He was their guides, he was their interlocutors. Uh, and these are people, you know, who are trained at various places. 
you know, Columbia, I think in some cases, like Galvan, I think he can't remember which US institution he went to, but like he really understood anthropology and he also understood the methods of an anthropology of the past that I was, you know, snarkily writing against. And here my informants like wanna do that. So it's kind of, it was kind of interesting. Thank you. Les, were you gonna ask something? Yeah, um, I guess I, I shouldn't turn on my uh, video just in case. I guess I, uh, it's sort of a, a different way of thinking about Sarah's question. Um, how, how has this book or, or the work on this book, how have you communicated it to, and I, I just wanted to say also thank you for this fantastic presentation. Um, and I should have started with that, but um, it, it's, so, it's so provocative. Um, how has your, your work that's, that's uh, led to the publication of the book, how have you communicated that to the people that, um, that you know in the Shingu and, and how has it been received? Well, um, certainly I had two, uh, especially two, maybe three slightly a little bit, but mostly two people helped me with translations. So they kind of understood what I was doing. Um, they were interested in it. Repri and Sabino, by the time I really started on this, had already passed away. So I didn't really get to discuss it with them. I talked with their families, their sons, especially, um, uh, somewhat one daughter, um, and asked permission if I could do this. You have to ask permission for using the photos too. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of those men have died of COVID, one on each one, Preparee's son, Sabino's son recently died in the last couple of years, but there are still, you know, son, a few sons remaining. Well, one son on one side and one son and one daughter on, on Sabino's side. And um, part of the stipulation for being able to do it is that I sh do not take any profits from it, but that was also the case with my first book. I uh, I'm required to send money back to people. Um, unfortunately, there isn't gonna be a whole lot of profit as we know from academic books. And I also think that Brazilian anthropologists are quite annoyed when people like me do this because we have uh, you know, like more money to make from these books and it makes them look bad. So I do feel like slightly bad about that. There's no easy answer, you know, nothing is easy. So, I mean, I'm way, I mean, I will send profits back. And I think that is what people really want. They would like the cash, honestly. Uh, I did the index myself. So I'm hoping that that will encourage, you know, I'll get a little more royalties from this and it won't just all go to the press. So I guess to answer your question, how they're viewing it, they're viewing it as a, as a resource. I think they like that their parents' stories are out there, that people care about it, that books are published on it. Um, I don't know if they have an idea of like a larger project that they're pursuing with it. Is that kind of what you were wondering about was the latter thing? Yeah, I just, I mean, uh, it just seemed like the, that you could turn the decolonial question around and sort of say, well, there's your intention, but then, you know, there's what their intention and, and how they see it and, and their investment and their, how they view the project. And yeah, no, I, I completely see what you're saying. And um, I, I feel like that's, that's not an unusual sort of scenario at all, but exactly what you might expect. I mean, I think the narrators themselves, I think they did want their stories out or they would not have recorded them. Um, Preparee wanted, I think, he perhaps wanted more of his performances, which I included in the first book. Um, but I, I think he was interested in having these spread around too. These guys are part of Brazilian history in the interior. They hobnobbed with some of the, you know, most important movers and shakers of the era, indigenous and non-indigenous. A lot of the chiefs in the upper Xingu who also had recently died of COVID are were really big deals. Um, they shaped indigenous policy. 
uh, and I think these guys, you know, want to wanted to explain how they were part of this stuff. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. I see Kendrick's hand is raised. Yes, Hi, Kendrick. Hi. I'm curious. So, like, in terms uh, regarding the perspectivism thing, and um, like on the on the Navajo reservation, there's blends of like Catholic Navajos, of of, of Mormon Navajos, and things like that as far okay. as far as the Kawite. Did you notice any kind of blending ideologies of religion within your own research? And then um, if you did, um, how did you, um, I suppose, uh, structuralize, structurally like parse that out? Um, or was it like kind of separate in, in another part of the area, another part of the research area? You know, that's a great question. Um, uh, I think in the, um, like in the thirties and forties, a lot of these people, especially Sabino, were involved with Catholics. And they, uh, especially Catholic missionaries, uh, Prepari, not so much. He really disliked missionaries because uh, they also disliked, you know, shamanism. That was not something they were into. So he moved away from missionaries, whereas Sabino actually worked with missionaries for a while. And I think um, religion was a tricky thing during the 90s in the Shingu, because they were supposed to be culturally pure, they weren't supposed to be Catholics. And yet a lot of people had a Catholic background. And in fact, you know, when I went to the archives, the Catholic archives, I saw a lot of these people, they really did have some kind of Catholic education. Um, I think people in the Amazon do a lot of conversion and then deconversion. They go with it for a while and then they deconvert because people did not talk to them about themselves. Whereas the Christian idea is once you're converted, you know, that's it, you're, you're on that direction. The Amazonian idea is, yeah, you can do that for a while, but then you deconvert too and you move away from it. And I think with the people who were in the Shingu were, were pretty much like deconverted from Catholicism. But Sabino, actually they both were baptized. I do talk about that in the book a little bit, some of the Catholic uh, rituals and things. Um, they were both baptized. They both, Sabino is a Christian name. Preparee was not, his was Lorenzo. But um, so they had that. The more complicating factor is the evangelicals. And that came in um, also in the 90s, but late 90s, early 2000s. And these guys were not uh evangelicals but a lot of people are evangelicals now and um that does change perspectivism quite a bit so that would look totally different although uh preparies a lot of his family members are not evangelical and they still um practice shamanism his son is a pretty famous shaman and they are not into the, the evangelical stuff, which is American. It actually comes from the Wycliffe Bible translators, the Summer Institute people, who then trained Brazilians and trained Kamiwete people. And then there was like a big conversion to that. Um, and I think that that is quite different. I think that's a different cosmology. And are people going to deconvert from that? Maybe. I mean, I would think the evangelicals would say no. I mean, once. Yeah, I was going to say they'd probably contest uh, something of that. Uh, the, the notions of, you know, moving away from at least anything that looks evangelical or, or Catholic. And I was just curious if you ran into that, like, or at least. Yeah. I, I yeah. think when I, when I go like, like, speak to Navajos that they're, you know, if I touch on something that kind of moves into Catholicism or Christianity, that they tend to push back just a little bit. And I was also wondering if you ran into that. I would say more than push back, I think people hit it because mm. they weren't, because the Shingu was supposed to be culturally pure. And, you know, you're supposed to be native, just native culture, nothing, uh, you know, nothing that was white or, um, so the Kamuete, because they had worked for so long in the rubber trade, they'd worked with missions, they'd done all this stuff. They came into the park, you know, with like those naked painted people and they were wearing full sets of clothes because of course they had for, for generations and they were kind of looked down upon as not having culture, as having lost their culture, have lost like the purity. So, and that even translated into, you know, movie team, 
video videographers, movies. They didn't want to film Kamiwate. They wanted to go to the south of the park where those, you know, naked, beautifully painted people are. And so that meant money. They got lots of film contracts. And the Kamiwate were always kind of disgruntled that they were pretty much overlooked. So I think talking about Catholicism would have been like, you know, saying we're not really indigenous. Mm. But I think that uh, is changing with evangelicalism. Okay. Hmm. All right. Okay. I just thought but that the, the park, op- the, the, the Shingu opened up and let missionaries in, in like, I don't know, the last 10 years or something. They never let them in, but they finally did. And then it was just like, whoosh. Ugh. People okay. converted quickly. All right. Thank you. Do you have any other last minute comments or questions? Well, I'm sorry I did not see the woman whose um, video stopped in the middle of her question. I I don't see anything in the chat. Yeah, um, that was Jessica Carey Webb. Um, so maybe she might, maybe she'll just email you. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to email with if you have any other comments or questions or anything. All right, well, thank you so much again, Dr. Oakdale. It was an enlightening presentation and thank you everyone for, for joining us this afternoon. Well, thank you for coming. Yeah, really appreciated that. Goodbye everyone. Bye.